Mark, okay. But I love Mark now. Oh my goodness, it is so good, so rich, so deep, and I hope you will be excited about Mark as we go along and that your journey is right along with us as we, uh, you know, when we're picking what to do, I just kept telling uh, Sandy and Connie, I said, I feel like we need to sit at the feet of Jesus, and I hope that we will do that this whole time and that you will enjoy it and um, we'll learn a lot from each other and about our wonderful Savior. So, um, if, you know, if you said the name of Jesus to uh, a group of strangers, you probably get a lot of reactions, right? You might get somebody who would say, smile at you and go, I know him as Savior too, and you, you would have an instant camaraderie, right? You might have somebody who would be angry at you, somebody who opposed Jesus, didn't want to hear anything about him. Um, or you might have a dismissive sigh or eye roll of somebody who's just like, that again. But of all the possible uh, uh, um, reactions that you might get, you probably would not get a blank stare of total confusion of somebody that um, didn't even know who you were talking about. Like, Jesus, what does that mean? It wouldn't be that because in our world here, just about everybody today, at least in our country where we are, um, has heard something about the man called Jesus. Now, if you roll back a couple of thousand years ago, that wasn't the case. And uh, most of those living in the days of the gospel writers may have heard some rumors about who this guy was over there. They, um, uh, they may have heard about a prophet or a teacher over there, and this person who maybe called themselves the son of God, but they didn't know a lot about him. And if you could put yourself back in that time period where we didn't have all the things that we know about Jesus today, and imagine for a minute my, what you might have thought if you heard rumors about this relatively unknown guy over there uh, who was saying the things that Jesus said, doing the things that Jesus did. Of course there's confusion. Of course there's skepticism. Of course there's this, I don't know what's going on over there with that guy. But even though some of the things he might have said seemed strange to them, um, the miracles that Jesus performed were kind of undeniable, right? I mean... Think about if you knew Bartimaeus from when he was a little boy, when he was blind, and now suddenly he's walking around the town and he can see clearly. Or Jairus, whose daughter was pronounced dead and the mourners had shown up and they were ready to carry her off to be buried, but now she's alive and walking around, right? Or of the talk to the thousands of people who ate and were filled and satisfied from a couple of fish and a few loaves of bread. The re the record of what happened to people like that, the real people in real places, forms the basis of Mark's gospel. See, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he set out to write down the events, and uh, so the people who didn't know Jesus, who didn't have the opportunity to see and hear him firsthand, could also understand and believe. So before we dive into this year-long uh, study of this book, we kind of need to know some background, right? So I want to spend a little time up front kind of letting us get to know who this guy is who we're reading his letter. I mean, who was Mark anyway? There's no introduction at the beginning of the book like you see in the epistles where Paul um, starts out right and he says, I'm the one who's writing this. There's no, nothing like that at the beginning of this, but really there's no historical, real historical debate about who the writer was. Most everybody agrees that it was Mark or John Mark is his, you know, he went by both those names. And so he wasn't a disciple of Jesus like um, John or Matthew. However, he was part of the early church. So I want to just give you a quick timeline of what the Bible does tell us about Mark or John Mark. Um, and I'm not going to read all of these. You can write them down and, and look at them or just scan over them as they go through. But I just want to kind of tell you what the Bible tells us about who this guy is. So he's first mentioned in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 12, where we see Mary, his mother, who John also called Mark, where the early church gathered to pray together. Later on in that same, uh, in same chapter, we see that Mark was a companion of, ba of Barnabas and Paul as they went on their first missionary journey. And Colossians chapter 4 tells us that Mark is the cousin of Barnabas. And so um, sometime later, Paul wants to go back to the cities of, of um, sorry. <laughs> and so he deserted, before I get to that, but he deserted them on one of their missionary journeys. And he was their helper, but he didn't stay around long. So he deserted them and went left to return. 
returned to Jerusalem. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us why it left, doesn't say what the problem was, but this was after a fairly fruitless, uh, seemingly fruitless uh, trip to Cyprus. So maybe he was discouraged, maybe he was tired, maybe he was just like, I'm done with this, I don't know. But later on, in Acts chapter 15, Barnabas wanted to take Mark with them and go on another uh, journey where Paul was saying, let's go and check up on people that we visited already. But it says Paul didn't want to take Mark with them because he was he felt like that he had deserted them and didn't stick around. And there was such a sharp disagreement between Barnabas and Paul that uh, they parted company. And Paul and Silas went one way, and Barnabas took Mark and went toward Cyprus. So there was this split, this chasm, this uh, this problem between Mark and uh, and Paul for a long time. But that's not where the story ends. Uh, in uh, Philemon, Paul uh, mentions Mark and calls him, this is way late, uh, after this, that he calls him a fellow worker. And so the last thing, uh, mention of Paul in the New Testament is at the end of Paul's life, in 2 Timothy, he tells Timothy to go get Mark and bring him with you because he's helpful to me in my ministry. So they have come back together and they've worked out their their stuff. And so this is what we know about Mark from the scripture. It's always encouraging just as an aside when you read these kind of things. These guys who were used so powerfully by God, the Paul and Mark and Barnabas and all these guys, they had problems just like we do. They had disagreements and they had to work through it and they had to really uh, come around restoration and wholeness. And it's so encouraging to me that these guys were not just super human sort of guys. They had their problems just like we do. And so that's uh, what we know from Scripture. Let me tell you a little bit more about uh, where, uh, where Mark got his information. He wasn't like a, a disciple, like I said. Didn't hang around with Paul like Luke did to get his information. So his information, most agree, most the history really agrees that he was informed by Peter. So he got it from a uh, uh, eyewitness, from a, a pretty reliable eyewitness at that. And he wrote down what Peter said, what Peter uh, told him under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And that's what forms the basis of the Gospel of Mark. And, um, and so it is also the first Gospel written in 55 to 65 A.D. And it's not the first book of the New Testament, but it's the first Gospel, the first record we have of Jesus' life. And why is that important when it was written as opposed to hundreds of years later? That's because people were still alive. This is only a couple of decades after the uh, resurrection of Jesus. So there's people still alive who knew it. Jairus' daughter might be still alive. And so she's going, yeah, I, yeah that happened to me. <laughs> you know, so, um, you know, a lot of people who experienced the miracles firsthand, if, if Mark had made up this story, then they could have gone, yeah. That's not what happened. I was there. I saw it. I heard it. So it gives us a lot of uh, confidence in what Mark wrote because it was so very close to the timeline of when it actually happened. And so his audience is the church in Rome, or specifically Gentiles. Now, it's important to note that he's writing to this group because, you know, when you write a letter, you're talking to, writing a letter to your boss, it has a whole different content than if you're writing to your sister, right? So you leave some things out that, and explain some things to your boss that your sister might know firsthand or vice versa. So it matters who, who we're writing to. And this is specifically because you'll see in this um, gospel that it is a gospel of action. And that plays to this uh the church in Rome because they were used to power and authority. So he talks a lot about Jesus' power and authority, which would have made a big difference to those in the church at Rome. Now, while all the Gospels tell the same story, Mark emphasizes him as the son of God and gives us all of this stuff. It goes rapid fire through the stories of Jesus and, and his miracles. And... Um, so as we move along, you're going to notice that one of Mark's favorite words is immediately or straight away or some other word like that. In, 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 it says that in some translations. And Mark uses it 42 times in 16 chapters. 42 times. It's only used 12 other times in the whole of the New Testament. And if you notice that the title of our series is also called Following Jesus Immediately. I picked that word on purpose because that's the point. When we recognize who Jesus is, 
It demands a response. And not a response that I'm thinking about, a response right now. So I know you're the son of God. I know you're God in heaven. I know you have uh, uh, died for my sins. The answer is yes. And yes right now. And so that's why I picked that. So the gospel of Mark uniquely puts way less emphasis on Jesus' teaching and points again and again and again to his power and his authority and reminds us that we just can't take his teaching without also realizing and accepting Jesus is also God. That's the point, and that's the singular point of the whole gospel. Now, before we jump right into uh, uh, the chapter, I want you to notice that uh, this chart is back there on that back stand. If you didn't get one, pick it up because we're going to refer back to this over and over and over as we go through. And this is just a timeline of Jesus' life. The gray here are the events that are included in the Gospel of Mark. You'll see down here at the bottom, these are the chapters as we move along. And this is just to help you keep a grasp on where we are in Jesus' three years of ministry. So you see there's a big jump from first year to second year. So we go up really fast through the first part of Jesus' ministry here in Jerusalem. And so as you we're going through, it's like, oh, we're reading Mark chapter 7. Where are we in the timeline? We're way over here. So I just want to help you see where we are and so you can just kind of see what's going on. It's not my chart. I found it. I thought it was really helpful. So so uh, just keep that with you, and we'll come back to that over and over. Hope that will be helpful you to see what's going on uh, with everything else that's going on in his life. So let's jump right in to Mark chapter 1, verse 1. And this is the, the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now this is the thesis statement, if you remember your English, for the rest of the entire book. This is what he's about. This is the title, this is the theme, this is everything that's everything else that you're going to read for the next 16 chapters is under this head. Okay? The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And all of these words are important in this. So I want to spend a little time right here just kind of unpacking this a little bit because it does lay the foundation for what, everything else that goes on in the book. So... Let's uh, start with the first one, and that's the beginning, right? When he says beginning, what does that imply, right? It's not just the beginning of the letter, not just the beginning of the chapter, not just the beginning of the book. It is the beginning of everything else that's going on in the, in the uh, chapter. Chapter 1 is not the beginning. The whole book is the beginning. It's not of the story of Jesus. It's not over when it gets to the cross and the resurrection and the ascension. What Mark writes in the entire book is the beginning of the gospel. So it's obviously not exhaustive here, uh, as if one book could hold all there is to know about Jesus. <laughs> it's not possible. Uh, but there is enough in here to tell us who Jesus is and what he came to do for us. Now, let's jump to the end of the verse. The Son of God, okay? So... Uh, a lot of people say that the, the lineage or the family tree of Jesus is in Matthew and Luke, but there's not anywhere else. But, you know, as I was thinking about this, I'm like, I think there is a family tree here, right? <laughs> it's not this long bunch of hard names that just goes on and on for a whole chapter, but it is very simple. Mark is very pared down. He doesn't say a whole lot of fluffy stuff. He's right to the point. And what he's saying here, Jesus, son of God. That's it, <laughs> right? It's like God the Father, God the Son, there's his heritage. That's all you need to know, and that's what all the miracles, all the teaching, all the power, and all the authority are meant to show us. It's not that he's a great guy. It's not that we should live by his rules so we uh, will be happy and healthy and all of that like the world wants to say to us today. Um, it's not what the progressive church is trying to say to us now that, you know, all that stuff doesn't really matter as long as he just teaches us how to live. You know, that's just all he was about. The gospel isn't about social change, though. The gospel will change society. I mean, it's not about being good citizens of the world, but if you're following the gospel, you will be a good citizen of the world. The gospel proclaim clearly that Jesus is God. That is the point. His lineage is brief in the Gospel of Mark, but it is wholly divine. Okay? So it's plain and simple. And that has to be the mindset that we take to every other part of the Gospel that we read. This is a 
most important thing. This is what Mark is about. And it has got to be supreme in our thinking when we study these Gospels and we want to learn about Jesus. You cannot take him without his divinity. You can't do it. Okay? So the next thing, back up, we're going to look at Jesus Christ. Now, we're so used to saying Jesus Christ, it's like, okay, is that his last name? <laughs> Jesus Christ is not Jesus' last name. Christ is is a title, okay? And if you were asked to define what does Christ mean, you might say Savior or Messiah, and you would be right, right? That's essentially correct, but there's more to it than that, and it's important that we understand this word because it gives an insight to what the first century people who heard this word thought, and it helps us understand what when they, why they re people reacted the way they did when he said Christ or people called him Christ. So let's do a little word study. Now, if you don't like word study, just hang with me. We'll get through it just really fast. And some people really like that because it does get depth to what we're talking about. So the word Christ in the Greek is Christos, okay? And that is a translation of the Hebrew, which is Mashiach, which means Messiah. And that word Messiah means anointed, okay? So the Christ means the anointed God. That's what the word means. And so to anoint, you know, literally means to pour something on something else. You think about the Good Samaritan. When the man had wounds, he took the oil and wine and he poured it on. That was anointing those, um, those wounds that he had. It was actually, uh, this word is where we get our word for, uh, for ointment. Okay? So, and, but in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, the intent of ceremonial anointing was to set apart a person, a place, or a thing for divine use. You think about um, the temple, with te the temple items were anointed, an altar might be an anointed. Uh, in, in the Old Testament specifically, prophets were told to anoint uh, kings. And they were told to go get a horn of oil, a literal horn, horn of oil, and pour it on the head of the new king. King, and it might be familiar with the story of David. That when he was out in the sheep fields, uh, Samuel shows up, says, "Where's your sons?" And he's looking at them, and they say, "Go get David, the little youngest one. I need to see him." And when he shows up from the sheep fields, he says, "This is the one." Takes the horn of oil, pours it on his head, and anoints him as the new king of Israel. Even though he doesn't take the throne for years after that, and so. This pouring of the oil, this anointing, is how new kings were crowned. And so in the context of the Old Testament, it meant that God himself had ordained this person, had chosen this person, and given him divine authority to lead his people. Okay, so when we say Jesus Christ, we are saying God's anointed one, God's chosen king. Okay, that's really important to remember that Christ means anointed one, the chosen king. So let's back up to Mark chapter 1, and let's talk about the word gospel a minute. And you're like, okay, I know what that means. That means good news. And you would be right again. That's good news. Uh, but the Greek word for that is euangelion. Euangelion. It means good news, but it's not just any type of good news, like, uh, oh, our family's having a new baby. That's good news. Or I had a good crop of wheat this year. That's good news. Uh, it's not just the good news of any type of, of whatever you think is going on in your life. It's a specific type of good news, and it refers to the coming of a king. You and Gelion, the specific good news of a coming king. So when a new king was crowned, the announcement was you and Gelion. Okay? It's the new king has taken power. And so you remember your favorite, the favorite Christmas verse, uh, the Charlie Brown verse, who says the angels show up and say, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. And so this is euangelion of good, great joy. And look at that. It also says down here, today in the town of David, a Savior has born to you. He is Christ the Lord, God's anointed king. This is what the announcement was. Now, why was the coming of a new king good news? Because a new king, particularly a respectable, a, uh, a moral, and an upright king, was good news 
to the kingdom, right? People back then were at the mercy of the rulers that were in power. And so often they were either at best disinterested in the people of the com community and of their kingdom, and at worst, they were evil, right? So citizens longed for a righteous king to rule them. And that meant prosperity, peace, end of war, stability, and justice. Because back then, there wasn't any court system like we know here in our country, right? And imagine what it would be like to live in a place where there was no police, no court system, where the weak and the old and the poor were subject to the whims of anybody who was stronger than them. So the announcement of a good coming king back in the Old Testament brought a sense of relief. Now they have a righteous judge. Now they have someone that they can turn to. And the good news was to widows and orphans and the poor and the downtrodden and prisoners, this was great news to them. If they had a moral king on the throne, they had somebody to appeal to and to turn to for protection and for justice. And this is exactly what you see written in Isaiah 61 and later read by Jesus in the temple when he says, this is fulfilled in me. Isaiah 61 says, the spirit of the Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor, bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim freedom for the captives, release from darkness for prisoners, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And this is you and Gileon. This is what it is. This is good. the good news that Mark starts off with is that Jesus has taken place as ruler, the chosen king picked by God is on the throne. That's what the message is. And as we're going to see as we move along through all of these chapters, how many times Jesus talks to his followers about the kingdom of God. It's not like the kingdom of earth. This kingdom of God that I've brought is different. It is different. And let me help you understand. And he had come to institute a righteous rule on earth. And they would be inaugurated through his death and his resurrection. So when people came uh, from the first century, heard the words Christ, they heard the words Messiah, they heard the word gospel, it is wholly connected to this idea of a king and his kingdom. So they hear it with different ears than we do today. So when the people of the first century uh, uh, heard that, uh, it was very important to them, and it changed. So they got their attention really, really fast when they said that. It's like, wait, wait, what? What? New king? He's come? So this is super important for us to remember as we go along. Mark was announcing and about to give te testimony and witness to the power and the authority of Jesus as the anointed one of God. And uh, so this count is going to keep uh, compelling us to step back and say the, that the good anointed king by uh, the anointed of God, the king, he's here. And so you can't stay neutral after that, after seeing what Jesus did all the way from the beginning of this gospel throughout this book. So we can't stay neutral. We have to come face to face with who Jesus really is. So that's verse one. <laughs> well, we're going to keep going. We'll pick up space, uh, speed, but I did really want to lay that foundation and that groundwork because it's so important to the rest of the book. So, uh, when Mark goes on, and after he gives us that, that thesis statement there, he doesn't talk about things like Jesus' birth. He doesn't give us interesting stories about wise men or angels or shepherds or talk about Jesus as a boy. He jumped right into giving us three witnesses to the test of, to the identity of who Jesus is and his authority. So we're going to move through these really quickly, but they are important. So I want to talk about those. And in verse 2, the first witness to Jesus' identity and authority are the prophets. And... Um, it says here that, um, that it is written in the prophets, or your, your version might say Isaiah the prophet. Some manuscripts include the word Isaiah. But really what is, is this statement is a summary of three distinct Old Testament texts from Exodus, Malachi, and Isaiah. You see that up there on the screen. And um, he kind of blends them all together into one. And with the point he's telling us here to, that the voice crying in the, the wilderness, in the desert, is to prepare the way for the Lord. Not prepare the way for a prophet, not prepare the way for the teacher, not prepare the way for some, you know, even some king, just random king out there. He's saying prepare the way for 
the Lord. Once again, giving it some emphasis on the coming one is divine, not just another person. And so he jumps right into the second of the, the witnesses to Christ, which is the promised forerunner in verses 4 through 8. And we know him as John, John the Baptizer, say it that way instead of John the Baptist, because it gets people confused with the domination. Uh, Baptists draw their name from the method of the way we baptize by immersion, the way John did, and not the other way around. So John was not the first Baptist. So, <laughs> you've ever heard anybody say that? But uh, when he showed up, it was a big deal when he showed up on the scene because no prophet had been around for 400 years. And if you look at the very last verse of the Old Testament in Malachi, he says, he says, see, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn his heart of the fathers to their children, and so on, he says. And then that's the end of the Old Testament. That's the last thing that said, and then there was silence for four centuries. There was no prophet. There was no teacher. There was uh, nobody coming on. And uh, when John showed up, everything got all astir because, wait a minute, is God doing something new? We haven't seen or heard from anything uh, in a, a teacher of the, of the word at all and so people started coming out from the desert to hear what he had to say and getting baptized which by the way uh, enraged the teachers of the law who were insistent that God's people didn't need to be baptized the only people who needed to be baptized were those Gentiles who were converting to Judaism but John was boldly teaching and calling out hypocrisy and, and that was rampant everywhere and not surprisingly he had, a, he had a really big following and he made a lot of enemies too that we'll talk about in a few weeks and then in verse 6 Mark uh, ta starts talking about uh, a fa John's fashion statement here he's talking about yeah, clothing and camel tail and a leather belt and what he ate and everything now remember that Mark does not use a lot of fluffy words he doesn't like uh, include a lot of things, so if he yeah, in, in, uh, includes this, it's important, right? But very few times in Scripture do we have any reference to what people wear it or wearing because it doesn't usually make any 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 big deal about it. So it kind of seems a little strange on the surface, but uh, there is a big deal about this. Does anybody kind of know anybody else who dressed similarly to this? Elijah. Yeah, Elijah. Yes, exactly, and that's what we see in Second Kings chapter 1, is that uh, Elijah made a garment of hair, uh, wore a garment of hair and a leather belt around his waist. And so when we put that this together with what Mark says here about John, we can understand why the clothing are important. Yeah, and the Malachi verse that I showed you said that someone like Elijah would show up and herald the coming of the Lord. So everybody, it's not hard to see why everybody got all excited about this. And uh, so a lot of popularity sprung up, a lot of energy around what he was doing. And his, but instead of John embracing his own fame and his own popularity, he was totally aware of his place and what he was there to do, which is what is said in verse 7 and 8. He says, After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop, stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, everybody wore sandals back then, but rich and influential people did not touch their own sandals. They had somebody, a servant in their household, who would come and take the sandals off and put them on so they didn't get their hands dirty. So they had slaves to do that. So John is saying here, this one to come after me is so exalted, so grand, so much higher than me, I can't even do the lowest servant lowest form of service to him. I can't even untie his sandals because he's so much greater than I am. He's basically saying, Messiah's coming. I'm nothing. He's everything. And the baptism he's saying I'm doing now, this is only a foreshadowing of the real baptism of the Holy Spirit that he is bringing. And uh, then Mark goes on to tell us about the baptism and it's recorded in all four of the gospels and so it's super important anytime we see something in all four of the gospels we need to pay attention to it but mark gives us one sentence about it he doesn't tell it hardly anything but his emphasis is what happened in the baptism and what happened after jesus baptism and that's where we get the third and final witness to jesus power and uh, authority and that's the trinity itself in verses 9 through 11 
Jesus is coming up out of the water. He saw heaven being torn open, and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. And so we have the prophets, we have John, and now the Father and Spirit giving witness to the, uh, to the authority, the identity, and, the, and giving approval to Jesus. And notice what it says here, that the heavens are torn open. Not just opened up, but torn open. The dome of the celestial ceiling was just ripped apart, very much like what it says in Isaiah 64. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you. God the Son did come down, the heavens were ripped open, and this verse from Isaiah is fulfilled right here at Jesus' baptism, again testifying to the divinity of Christ. He is the Lord. God, the Son. And so this voice of approval comes directly from the Father. He says, you're my Son, whom I love, with you I'm well pleased. Also sounds like Isaiah 42. Here is my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one. See that again? In whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him. This is what happened at the baptism. And he will bring justice to the nations. And in seeing this as an announcement... From the heaven by the Father, this brings us back where do we started at the beginning in verse 1, which is the de declaration of euangelion, the good, the good news. Jesus has been chosen to rule over his people, and at this moment, he is declared king, the chosen one. And God says, good news, sinful humanity. The good and righteous king is here, and he will save you from your sin. And the first thing Jesus does then, this is where we'll stop today, is that at once he goes out into the desert, and he was in the desert for 40 days being tempted by Satan. Now, the other Gospels give a much longer uh, 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 discussion about the temptation of Jesus in the desert. But once again, Mark is very brief with his words. He just tells us this, but it's important enough to notice here that at the close of this lesson, We'll see that Jesus' first act as the good king who is here is to face the same temptation that Adam faced. Toe-to-toe -to -toe with the temptation of Satan. And uh, here, where the first Adam failed, the second Adam, Jesus, succeeded. Where the first Adam caved, the second Adam stood firm. Where the first Adam doubted God, the second Adam remained stalwart and trusted God. When the first Adam sinned, the second Adam remained sinless. And that's the whole point of the wilderness temptation. He proved himself to be the worthy and the righteous king. So you and Gelion, right? Good news. Now normally I wrap up a, a, a lesson with, a pat, uh, with application, but uh, these verses are really interested, interesting here, but they aren't meant for us to debate about should we, uh, how do we prepare the way for the Lord at Christmas or a mo talk about modes of baptism or meeting God out in our wilderness situations or how to stand firm about, uh, against Satan? Those are all really great things to take away and consider. But specifically in these opening verses of the Gospel of Mark, we need to do exactly as Mark calls his first readers then, uh, the readers then and the readers now to do, and that is to consider the identity of Jesus. So, who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to you? We're going to hear Jesus ask this question to his disciples later on, where he says, uh, who do you say that I am? But right now, the takeaway for today, and through the rest of our study, all the way through next May, is to consider, who is Jesus to you? Not to your grandmother, not to your daughter, not to your mom, not to the people in your Bible study or anything you've heard on, uh, on, on YouTube or whatever you are. Who is Jesus to you? Right? Can you say like these witnesses that you are certain that he is the Lord, the powerful one and God's true son? Is that what you say? And if you say yes, Next question to consider is, does your life match what your words say? If not, are you willing to change that? Are you willing
willing to acknowledge him as the Lord and the rightful one to tell you what to do? Are you willing to bow your knee, your opinions, your desires, your past, your plans, your everything to Jesus and say yes to him as the anointed ruler of all? Because it's what we do with our actions that really is the true test of whether we really believe. Amen? Amen. All right, God, thank, we thank you so much for this rich and deep book. We thank you for the announcement of you and Gilead to us that the righteous king is on the throne. But it's not a righteous king that's far away that we can't approach, but you invite us to come to you right now. You invite us to be really close, to sit at your feet, to get to know you in a personal way. God, let us set aside all the trappings of this world that have our attention and distract us from the most important thing, and that is knowing you. God, let us take this time that we have to dwell in your word to be drawn closer to you and know you as King of kings and Lord of lords. And it's Jesus' powerful, mighty name that we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, ladies, pick a group. You're, uh, the, if you didn't get a... Um, if you didn't get one of these, y'all come see me. If we, if we were handing them out at the beginning, if you came in...